converted man here. Welcome back kids. Today we're going to hunt some more fallacies. Today's fallacies come from Dan Barker when he was having a debate in Oxford Hall. He's first going to attack the coherence of Christianity and then he's going to go after the resurrection. Take a look. I'd love to look at the original debate but you didn't link it so just telling me where it happened doesn't really help. He's had a lot of debates. So, you know, no citation. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, great. If nothing comes from nothing, then God cannot exist. Because God is not nothing. If that premise is true, that nothing comes from nothing, and if God is something, then you've just shot yourself in the foot. Now, it's important to note that Dan here is responding to something said by the apologist, by the theist that he's debating. Probably something along the lines of nothing comes nothing. We don't know that. We don't know what comes from nothing or that nothing is even a thing in the first place. But what he's trying to establish, it seems to be, in this cherry-picked, uh, non-cited debate quote that's being used to pick apart supposed logical fallacies that he's making, is that if you have nothing and then but you have something then which is it that, that god came from nothing well because god's always been there so it's it's okay for god to break the rules but it's not okay for anything else he's trying to point out the special pleading being used for god but of course logan jones he's not going to understand that is he now let's let's listen let's check it out Play the clip. Straw man fallacy. Christianity doesn't teach that God came into being from nothing. Christianity teaches that God always exists. No, it is not a straw man fallacy because he's not saying or even implying necessarily that this is what God is or where God came from. In fact, he's saying that if this is the case, if X is true, then Z has to be true. That if you have nothing and comes from from nothing yet you don't have a nothing you have a something that is making something else come from nowhere that's still a nothing coming from nothing you're just having something make the nothing come out of it or he might have been saying that if you have nothing and you have nothing then you have a difference here with this particular concept of God that's a something because it's 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 uniquely different there's some special pleading going on so because you didn't give me the link to the full debate I don't really know what Dan's trying to argue I can only infer some things and based on what I've heard here I could say that Dan has performed the fallacy of composition which might happen during a rebuttal part of a debate it's not unusual it's hard to extract exactly what it is he's trying to say exactly but i can infer from what i know of apologist typical tactics and what i know of of how you want to frame these sort of things that it seems likely that dan's trying to say that if you have this concept that you can't have a nothing come from a nothing but then you simultaneously hold this concept that you have this something that didn't come from anything that's very similar that there is some sort of special pleading going on here so if anything it's a formal fallacy that he performed not an informal fallacy and that's different but i mean you know it's not like you would know the difference between a formal and informal fallacy anyways. <laughs> uh. Not that he came into being. Therefore, we aren't saying that something came into being from nothing. The same could be conceivably true of the universe, that it always existed, but we believe that it came into being because of other scientific reasons. If the universe came into being, it couldn't have come into being from nothing, and if God came into being, he couldn't have come into being from nothing. Why not? Why can't that be the case? Why can't something come into being from nothing? Why? Why is? Why do you think that's true? What? 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 Oh, don't, she's not going to answer that. Okay. We just don't believe that God came into being. The uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ 
The story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the absolute worst example anyone could possibly give for the reliability of the Bible. Hold it right there. No Christian uses the resurrection to argue for the reliability of the Bible. Hold it right there. First of all, that's a universal claim that you can't hope to know that it's true because there are Christians all over the world, and at least one of them might have made that debate at some point, so you don't know that that's the case. But I happen to find the actual full argument, so now I can find out what point Dan is responding to. Let's pull that up, shall we? I read the New Testament. I pondered on the record of Jesus' life that I found there. I meditated on his wisdom teaching and I tried to live out his ethics, just as you might with any charismatic thinker. And then I realized that the call, follow me, meant exactly that, because I was being taken somewhere to a place that was unfamiliar and edgy a place that at once invited God talk, because God talk is what we invoke when we're at the edge of our explanatory and existential capacities, but a place that at the same time challenged conventional definitions of God, turning many of them completely on their head, a place where nothing was as I had thought. The tension between this place and the place where we do our empirical science and rational philosophy is, I think, well captured by a story told by John near the end of his Gospel. It's the very famous account of Doubting Thomas. Thomas is a model of the rational sceptic who demands empirical evidence as the basis for his convictions. An altogether good chap. Thomas is looking for data that will support the ludicrous notion that Jesus has risen from the dead. And the data points he seeks are interesting. They are holes made by nails and a wound made by a spear, marks of torture and murder. But when he is finally presented with the battered but living human body that forms his data set, Thomas doesn't say, ah, now I can reject the null hypothesis with an acceptable degree of certainty. You will recall that he says simply, my Lord and my God. Here at the edge of efficacy, Thomas has been catapulted into another place, a place where he instinctively invokes God language. That's a lot to listen to, but unlike Logan Jones, I'll actually provide the full debate in my description so you can listen to the entire thing. It's a long uh, debate between several people. It's, two, it's a 2 hour 33 minute and 13 seconds to be precise debate between Christians and non-Christians. It's very interesting and thorough. Now during this live at the time presentation Dan's having to make notes about what she is saying. So it's understandable that he's going to make mistakes. He heard Bible, because here in this clip that I isolated from the rest of her speech, she brings up the Bible, her personal experience of reading through it and how, how she viewed it, something about God talk, which I have no idea what the bleep any of that's supposed to be about. And then this particular story that she thinks is maybe a reflection of what this debate that they're having here and now is. Here's this story in the Bible with this character, which is, as far as I know, made up of, of Thomas, who now is called Doubting Thomas because he's doubting, and he, he's given the evidence, and, and instead of saying, well, that's great, he says these God words, and that's supposed to mean something, I guess, but it's understandable that Dan would write down Bible, uh, Bible story, and it does seem that he inferred that she's saying that this is a good way to understand the reliability of the Bible, even though that's not what she said. Certainly, it's understandable that he might infer that's what she said. So, in this instance, you would have been correct in calling this 
a straw man. Because he's not really attacking the argument that she made. By the way, she didn't really make much of an argument, if any. But her citing the Bible at all to try to justify anything would at best be circular reasoning. But surely, you're not going to use circular reasoning, are you, Logan? No, come on, Logan Jones would never use circular reasoning. They use the evidence for the resurrection to argue for the resurrection. <laughs> he did the thing that I said he wasn't going to do. There isn't any evidence. If there was, you would point to the evidence. What you have, as Dan pointed out, is several different stories which conflict with each other, and then an attempt by some to use that as if it was evidence to say that it happened. Now, usually what happens in these arguments that didn't happen now, but does happen in other locations and places and times is that you'll have the apologists say, you know, here are the resurrection stories and all these uh, people that I'm not going to name names of, they all agree on these uh, essential points that all the Gospels do agree upon. We're going to ignore all the stuff that they don't agree upon, like what time of day it was, you know, and how many people went to the tomb, and whether they told the disciples or not. Just ignore all that. Here's the central things that are agreed upon. And then we're going to pretend that those things are actually evidence rather than just stuff that was written and then say, well, there, there you go. See, there was, there was a death and then there was a tomb and then the disciples came to believe. See, all the things agree that those four things are true. Therefore, it had to have happened. Uh, what? How? What? No, it's just something that somebody wrote down. Look, I can do it too. But that isn't evidence that it's true. Written documentation like this certainly wouldn't be enough to prove to anybody that you owe me any amount of money. The resurrection story is given five times. You can compare them. Scholars have never been able to reconcile those contradictory accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that the resurrection stories have differences actually strengthens the case for the resurrection. If they were exactly the same, then that would mean that they are all stemming from the same historical source, which would mean that we have one historical source for the resurrection. As it is, the resurrection narratives have so many differences that we know that we are dealing with different independent sources. Either way, it doesn't help your case. Look. We have differences of writings here. Either you owe me money, I owe you money, or you're in debt to of some high amount, or payment is due. I'm sure that we can all agree that somebody owes somebody money, but even that statement might not be true. Simply because somebody wrote it doesn't mean that it's true. And them agreeing with each other or not doesn't help the case one way or the other. If they were exactly the same, then that would mean that they are all stemming from the same historical source, which would mean that we have one historical source for the resurrection. As it is, the resurrection narratives have so many differences that we know that we are dealing with different independent sources. This fact actually strengthens the case for the resurrection since it satisfies the historical criterion of multiple attestation for determining if an event is historically reliable. I would love a citation for this. Apologists love to say that they're using the historical method, but there's more than one historical methodology out there, and no apologist seems bothered to actually cite what version they're using, from whom, from what academy how how does it work what's the methodology but even more important than that would be to explain how even though your particular holy book is going to be in the category of myth and it's going to be there because we have to put it there that is to say when any thing that is simply written that ought to, that's claims to have miracles, gods, demons, devils, angels, afterlife, 
people coming back to life, whatever. All of that stuff is categorized as mythology, no matter when it's written. I could write it today, I could write it tomorrow, I could write it yesterday, it doesn't matter. Why? Because we have never observed those things to be things that can occur. So how would you ever hope to have any proof for the mythical elements of this historical narrative? There wouldn't be any possible way to say, well, because we have X number of people saying that it happened, that makes it true. No, that's an appeal to uh, popularity. There, there's a uh, bazillion Hindus that will say right now that their guru of choice is able to perform miracles today. But of course, if you examine the guru, well, you'll see that nothing is going on of any significant magical, mystical importance. But maybe you wouldn't be allowed to test them or, or watch them, you know, do their miracle or whatever. And so what you have to have is a methodology that shows that your particular mythology is actual history rather than just one more mythology out there. And that system that you have has to be applicable to show that other mythologies are false, whereas yours is true. I've never seen anyone do that. I don't think you're going to do it, and I just don't think it will be done. Besides that, we see through the development in the first century of the Christian myth that the earliest stories were simple. There were no angels. There were, there were very few remarkable events, but as you go 10, 20, 30 years later, you find more and more until you get to the book of John where you find these outlandish stories. What you see in the development of the resurrection story in the New Testament is the development of a legend. Starting simple, growing over time, getting more and more fantastic. It's a mistake to treat those accounts as if they were flat, as if they all happened at one time. We can see before our eyes the development from a simple, unvarnished, perhaps some element of truth in some story about someone who may have spiritually ascended, like we say grandma died and went to heaven. Maybe the early apostles said Jesus died and went to heaven, but that exaggerated. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not evidence for a God. Fallacy of suppressing evidence. He claims that you can trace the resurrection story's development from the earliest stories being the least fantastical and the latest stories being the most implausible and absurd. I'll give Dan Barker the benefit of the doubt and say that he's ignorant on this topic rather than that he's intentionally deceptive. Our first resurrection account which dates to decades earlier than when any of the Gospels were written, comes from 1 Corinthians 15. Historians unanimously agree that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. You know, it would be great if you had actually done any research on this and then provided citation for it so that I didn't have to go look it up. So Paul's first letter to Corinthians, according to Wiki, is anywhere from 53 to 57 AD. And according to this other website, the chronologically uh, ordered uh, New Testament, you've got James, you've got uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, all these things being written around the same time. But the stories would have been in circulation long before that. But it doesn't matter. You can still see an evolution from less extreme to more extreme by reading these in the chronology that appears on screen. Each one does get more exaggerated than the next. And that Paul is exaggerating it at the time that he pens it, if he indeed penned it, that just kind of proves the point. But we don't need to even have the examples of these stories becoming more legendary to say that's probably what happened because we have examples, mod almost modern day examples, of stories that start out very normal and that become exaggerated over retelling over time. We know that happens. We've seen it happen. It's demonstrably demonstrable that it happens. Now, if it went the other way, 
that wouldn't help matters either. It starts out fantastical and becomes more mundane. Well, the fact that it started out fantastical is a problem as well because you still have to show that the fantastical actually happened, which you haven't, and you can't, either because it doesn't happen or, I don't know, some other reason that I can't think of, like, uh, it's magic and it only works when no one is looking or something. In this passage, he gives a resurrection account in which Jesus not only appears to Peter, James, and all the disciples, but in which Jesus appears to a crowd of over 500 people at one time. Ah, good old calf. I mean, 500. This is what 500 means in Hebrew. It's complicated. It's also numerology, which is a fun thing that was a big deal for many Jewish people, so maybe the 500 just means calf, or however you're supposed to say that word. Don't ask me, I'm not Jewish. Let's ask somebody that's part Jewish. Hey, part Jewish person, how do I say this word? Cough. There you go. Cough. Or kof. Kof. Kof, cough. You say cough, I say kof. Let's drop the whole thing off. Oi. Anyways, so who are these people? Where do they live? What are their names? Where are they located? Just, here's a number. Okay, yeah, sure, why not? Nothing even close to this radical happens in our latest accounts, which all come from John. According to standard datings, there was a 40 year gap between the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and when the Gospel of John was written. What's even more interesting is that when Paul introduces his resurrection narrative, he uses technical terminology from his day that shows he was getting it from an earlier source. He says that he is delivering over a tradition that he received, and the words he uses for deliver and receive are technical words in the original Greek, showing that someone is passing on a tradition. And so Paul knew about the earlier stories that were in circulation, which is what I already had said. But I guess this guy wants us to think that Paul knew the extraordinary stories that were in circulation and talked about them in a way that shows that he already knew about them. So that means the non-extraordinary stories or less extraordinary stories are now the ones that were made up later on after Paul. Why would somebody make the story less extraordinary? That's really unusual. And, and then if they were going to do that, why wouldn't they say something like, hey, there's these extraordinary stories out there, but that's not what really happened. Here's what really happened. It wasn't that extraordinary. Sure, it was special, but it wasn't that special. You know, one of the Gospels ends with just Jesus dying. That's it, right? So that story now is suspect if we go with what this guy is saying. Because it was penned in the later after Paul as if that story couldn't have been told for all that time before it finally got penned down or that it did get penned down earlier on but we just don't have those those writings they were lost to time but none of that seems to enter this guy's mind because he's trying to salvage something from a misunderstanding of the biblical history. Many scholars date the time that he received this tradition to when he met with Peter and James in Jerusalem three years after his conversion, another event that is uncontested among historians, even among atheist ones. I love when people just say this as if it's true. What, what scholars, what historians, what atheist historians? Can we get names? Citation? No, it's just, you know, anonymous people that all agree that this is the way it is. Uh-huh, sure, sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. This means that the resurrection tradition likely comes from a maximum of five years after Jesus' death. It could have happened the day of the death. That tradition could have started then. And it really doesn't matter too much because we don't know that it really happened what what we could say at best is that the people began to believe it happened and then 
the problem is that we have groupthink, we have hive mind, we have the pressure of the sunk cost fallacy, cognitive dissonance. We have all these things going on at the same time. All it takes is one person to come to the group and say, no, no, I just saw Jesus. And, and you know, we talked and it was great. And then he went back into heaven. And then somebody, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I saw him too. Oh, I saw him too. And, and then it doesn't take long for it to become a legend. But it, even according to you, if I buy into the three-year thing, which I don't see any reason why I should, that's an extraordinary amount of time for a legend to develop. So the longer you have, the more likely it's legendary. But even if you didn't have that long, the fact that it seems legendary means it's probably legendary. After all, it took Joseph Smith how long to convince people that he found these golden tablets? What about Scientology? How long did it take to convince people that that was true? Not very long. It doesn't take that long to convince people of a story, of an idea, of a belief, and for them all to adhere to it, even to death. Look at Heaven's Gate cult. How long did that take to manifest and develop? And then if you have three years from the conception to the to that particular moment, how how much did Scientology expand from when Dianetics came out it, three years after that? How much did Mormonism develop from the beginning to three years after that? It just adds more problems, but even if you had it on that day, you'd still have the same problem of showing that it actually happened without just pointing to the writings. Writings are not evidence of something that we've never before seen happen anywhere else. That's why we categorize it as myth. Therefore, our absolute earliest resurrection account is in fact the most radical. We cannot trace the development of a resurrection myth as Barker claims. The Gospel of John makes no claims about Jesus appearing to crowds even close to the size of the one mentioned in our earliest account. Okay, so the size goes down later in time. So the less extraordinary accounts are the ones we have to be skeptical of. Okay, let's toss out John then. We don't need that one. I guess we don't need the ones before Paul either. So that leaves you with one gospel. Paul's gospel. Ooh, That's a problem. Eh, oh well. Therefore, Barker is flat out wrong on this point, and it is beyond me why he would make this as an argument since it is so blatantly false. Well, Dan got it right, and you're getting it wrong. Unless you're saying that that Dan got it wrong in a different way. That, that and then, then he would still be right to say that, that we can't trust these stories because... Instead of evolving to extraordinary, they devolved from extraordinary. Either way, like I said earlier, that's still a problem for your story. It changed. By the way, if you like this video, please subscribe. Since this is a new account, every subscriber makes a material difference. Also, I have a crazy video plan that I'll be releasing soon, so subscribe. A crazy video? More crazy than this one? Okay. Look forward to it. Probably won't respond to it. Probably won't see it, because I'm not going to subscribe. So... You know, whatever. But I'll send you a spiritual subscription. You know, lay up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. So you shouldn't be asking for material things anyways. In fact, you should give me double what you're asking me. So you should subscribe to me twice since you asked me to subscribe to you. I have no idea. Hello.